they showered together and after dressing, Garrett made Teresa breakfast while she finished packing her things. Zipping her suitcase and Teresa heard the sound of sizzling in the kitchen as the smell of bacon wafted through the house. After drying her hair and putting on some makeup, she walked into the kitchen. Garrett was sitting at the table drinking coffee and he winked at her when she entered. On the counter, he'd left a cup by a coffee maker and she poured herself some. Breakfast was already on the table, scrambled eggs, bacon and toast. Teresa sat in the chair closest to him. I didn't know what you wanted for breakfast, he said mentioning towards the table I'm not hungry Garrett if that is all right with you he smiled that's fine I'm not that hungry either she got up from her chair and went to him sitting in his lap she wrapped her arms around him and buried her face in his neck he held her tightly in return, running his hands through her hair. Finally, she pulled back and her time in the sun this week had left her tent. In her jeans shirts and clean white shirt, she looked like a carefree teenager. For a moment, she started down at a small flower design stitched into her sandals her suitcase and purse stood waiting next to the bedroom door my plane leaves soon and i have still got to check out of the hotel and return the rental car she said are you sure you don't want me to come with you she know that her lips pursed. No, I will be rushing just to catch my flight as it is, and besides, you'd have to follow me in your track. We can say goodbye just as easily here. I'm going to call you tonight. She smiled. I was hoping you would. Her eyes began to well with tears and he pulled her close. I'm going to miss having you here, he said as she started to cry in earnest. He brushed away the tears with his finger and his touch light against her skin. And I'll miss having you cook for me, she whispered, feeling foolish. He laughed, breaking the tension. Don't be so sad. We are going to see each other again in a couple of weeks, aren't we? Unless you are having second thoughts. He smiled. I'll be counting the days. And this time you are going to bring Kevin, right? She know that. Good, I'd like to meet him. If he is anything at all like you, I'm sure we'll get along great. I'm sure you will too. And until then, I'll be thinking about you all the time. You will? Absolutely, I'm already thinking about you. That's because I am on your lap. He laughed again and she gave him a watery smile. Then she stood and wiped the wetness from her cheeks. Garrett moved to her suitcase and picked it up and they both left the house. 
Outside, the sun was already climbing in the sky and it was warming up quickly. Teresa retrieved the sunglasses she kept in the side pocket of her purse and holding them in her hand as they walked to her rental car. She unlocked the trunk and he placed her things inside. Then, taking her in his arms and he kissed her once gently and released her. After opening the car door, he helped her inside and she put the keys in the ignition. With the door open, they stared at each other until she started the car. I have got to go if I'm going to catch my plane. I know. He stepped back from the door and closed it. She rolled down the window and put her hand out. Garrett took it in his for just a moment, then she shifted the car into reverse. You call tonight, I promise. She pulled her hand in, smiling at him, and slowly started forward. Garrett watched her as she waved one last time before driving off and wondering how on earth he'd get through the next two weeks. Despite the traffic, Teresa made it to the hotel quickly and checked out. There were three messages from Diana, each seemingly more spread than the last. What's going on down here? How did your date go? Read the first one. Why didn't you call? I'm waiting to hear all about it. Read the second and then the third said simply, you are killing me. Call me with the details, please. There was also one message from Kevin. She'd called him a couple of times from Garrett's house. And it seemed to be at least a couple of days old. She returned the rental car and reached the airport with less than a half an hour to spare. Luckily, the check her bags was short and she made it to the gate just as they were boarding. After handing her ticket to the stewardess, she boarded the plane and took her seat. The flight to Charlotte was only partly full and the seat next to her was vacant. Teresa closed her eyes thinking back on the amazing events of the past week. Not only had she found Garrett but she had come to know him better than she would ever have imagined possible. He had street deep feelings in her feeling she had long thoughts were buried. But did she love him? She approached the question gingerly, wary of what an admission like that would mean. She ran through their conversation of last night, his fears of letting go of the past, his feeling about not seeing her as much as he wanted to. These things she understood completely, but I think I'm in love with you. She frowned. Why did he add the word think? Either appeased her or had he said it for another reason. I think I'm in love with you. In her mind, she heard him say it over and over again. His voice edged with, what? Thinking about it now, she almost wished he'd said nothing at all. At least, then she wouldn't be trying to figure out exactly what he would mean. But what about her? Did she love Garrett? 
She shut her eyes tiredly, suddenly unwilling to confront her warning emotion. One thing was for sure, though, she wasn't ever going to tell him that she loved him until she was certain he could put Catherine behind him. That night in Garrett's dreams, a violent storm was well underway. Rain pelted hard against the side of the house. And Garrett ran frantically from one room to the next. It was the house he lived in now, and though he knew exactly where he was going, the blinding rain coming in the open windows made it difficult to see. Knowing he had to close them, he rushed to the bedroom and found himself entangled in the curtain as they blew inward. Fighting them off, he reached the windows just as the lights went off. The room went black about a storm. He could hear the sound of the distant siren. Warning of the hurricane, lightning illuminated the sky as he struggled with the window. It wouldn't budge. Rain continued to pour inward wetting his hands and making it impossible to get the grip he needed. Above him, the roof began to creak with the fury of the storm. He continued to struggle with the window, but it was jammed and wouldn't move. Finally, giving up, he tried the window beside it. Like the first window, it was stuck as well. He could hear the shingles being torn from the roof, followed by the crash of shattering glass. He turned and ran to the living room, and the windows there had exploded inward, spewing glass over the floor. Rain blew sideways into the room, and the wind was horrific. The front door was shaking in the frame. Outside the window, he heard Teresa begin to call for him. Garrett, you have got to get out now. At the moment, the bedroom windows crashed inwards as well. The wind gusting through the house began to tear an opening in the ceiling. The house wouldn't be able to stand much longer. Catherine, he had to get her picture and the other items he kept in the end table. Garrett, you are running out of time, Teresa shouted again. Despite the rain and blackness, he could see her outside, mentioning for him to follow her. The picture, the ring, the Valentine's Day's card. Come on, she continued to shout. Her arms were waving frantically. With a roar, the roof separated from the frame of the house and the wind began to tear it away. On instinct, he raised his arms above his head just as part of ceiling crashed down on him. In moments, everything would be lost. Not caring about the danger, he started towards the bedroom. He couldn't live without them. You can still make it. Something in the sound of Teresa's cry made him stop. He glanced toward Teresa, then toward the bedroom, frozen. More of the ceiling fell in around him. With a sharp splintering crack, the roof continued to give away. He took a step towards the bedroom, and with that, he saw Teresa still waving her arms. To him, it seemed as if she'd suddenly given up. The wine justed through the room, and unearthly how well that seemed to blow through to him.
furniture toppled over throughout the room. Blocking his path, Garrett police, Teresa shouted. Again, the sound of her voice made him stop and with that he realized that if he tried to save the things from his past, he might not make it out at all. But was it worth it? The answer was obvious. He gave up his attempt and rushed towards the opening where the windows had been. With his fist, he pounded out the shards and stepped out onto the back deck just as the roof was completely torn away. The walls began to buckle then and as he jumped onto the deck, they crumbled into a pile with a tenderness boom. He looked for Tressa to make sure she was okay, but strangely, he couldn't see her anymore. Early the next morning, Tressa was sleeping soundly when the sound of ringing phone jarred her awake. Fumbling for the phone, she recognized Garrett's voice instantly. Did you make it home okay? Yeah, I did, she replied groggily. What time is it? A little after six, did I wake you? Yes, I stayed up late last night waiting for your call. I started to wonder if you'd forgotten your promise. I didn't forget. I just figured you needed a little time to settle in. But you were confident I'd be up at the crack of dawn, right? Garrett laughed. Sorry about that. How was the flight? How are you? Good. Tired, but good. So I take it that the pace of the big city has already worn you out again. She laughed and Garrett's voice turned serious. Hey, I want you to know something. What? I miss you. You do? Yeah, I went into work yesterday even though the shop was closed, hoping to get some paperwork done, but I couldn't do much because I kept thinking about you. That's good to hear. It's the truth. I don't know how I'm going to get any work done over the next couple of weeks. Oh, you'll manage. I might not be able to sleep either. She laughed knowing he was teasing. No, don't go that far. I'm not into those super depends guys. You know, I like my men to be men. I will try to keep it in check then. She paused. Where are you now? I'm sitting on the back deck watching the sun come up. Why? Teresa thought about the view she was missing. Is it beautiful? It always is, but this morning I'm not enjoying as much as I usually do. Why not? Because you are not here with me to enjoy it. She lay back on the bed, making herself comfortable. Hey, I miss you too. I hope so. I'd hate to think I was the only one who felt this way. She smiled holding the phone to her ear with one hand and absently twirling stand of her hair with the other until they finally said a reluctant goodbye 20 minutes later and hung up the phone. Entering the office later than usual, Teresa felt the effects of her real white adventure finally catching up with her. 
she hadn't slept much. And when she'd looked in the mirror after talking to Garrett on the phone, she'd felt sure that she looked at least a decade older than she was. As usual, the first place she went once she got to work was the break room for a cup of coffee. And on this morning, she added a second packet of sugar to give her an extra jolt. Well, hello, Teresa, Diana said happily, striding in behind her. I thought you'd never get here. I have been dying to her everything that happened. Good morning, Teresa mumbled, stirring her coffee. Sorry I'm late. I'm just glad you made it at all. I almost ran over to your apartment last night to talk to you, but I didn't know what time you got in. I'm sorry for not calling, but I was a little worn out from my week. She said. Diana leaned against the counter. Well, that's not a surprise. I have already put two and two together. What do you mean? Diana's eyes were bright. I take it you haven't seen your desk yet. No, I just walk in. Why? Well, she said, raising her eyebrows, I guess you must have made a good impression. What are you talking about, Diana? Come with me, Diana said with a conspiratorial grin as she led her back into the newsroom. When Teresa saw her desk, she gasped next to the mail that had accumulated while she was gone stood a thousand roses, beautifully arranged in a large clear vase. They arrived first thing this morning. I think the delivery man was a little shocked that you weren't there to receive them, but I went ahead and said I was you, then he really looked shocked. Barely listening to what Diana had said, and Teresa reached for the card leaning against the waist and opened it immediately. Diana stood behind her, craning over her shoulder. It read, To the most beautiful women I know. Know that I'm alone again. Nothing is as it once was. The sky is grayer, the ocean is more forbidding, will you make it right? The only way is to see me again, I miss you, Garrett. Teresa smiled at the note and slipped it back inside the envelope, bending to smell the bucket. You must have had a memorable week, Diana said. Yeah, I did. Teresa answered simply, I can't wait to hear about it. Every spicy detail. I think... Teresa said, glancing around the newsroom at all the people watching her this secretly. That I'd rather talk to you about it later when we are alone I don't need the whole office gossiping about it. They already are, Tressa. It's been a long time since flowers have been delivered here. But all right, we talk about it later. Did you tell them who they were from? Of course not. To be honest, I kind of like leaving them in suspenses. She gave a small wink after looking around the newsroom. Listen, Teresa, I've got some work to do. Do you think we could have lunch today? Then we can talk. Sure, where? How about milk, honey? I bet you didn't find much sushi down in Wilmington. 
That sounds great. And Diana, thanks for keeping it a secret. No problem. Diana patted Teresa's shoulder gently and headed back to her office. Teresa leaned over her desk and smelled the roses again before moving to the waist to the corner of her desk. She began to search through her email for a couple of minutes, pretending not to notice the flowers until the newsroom resumed its chaotic patterns. Making sure that no one was paying attention, she picked up the phone and dialed Garrett at work. Jan answered the phone. Hold on, I think he is in his office. Who is calling, please? Tell him it's someone who wants to schedule some dive lessons in a couple of weeks. She tried to sound as distant as she could, not sure if Jan knew about them. Jan put her on hold and there was a silence for a short moment. Then the line clicked and Garrett came on. Can I help you? He asked, sounding a little frazzled. She, she said simply, you shouldn't have, but I'm glad you did. He recognized her voice and his tone brightened. Hey, it's you. I'm glad they arrived. Do they look okay? They are beautiful. How did you know I love roses? I didn't, but I have never heard of a woman who didn't, so I took a chance. She smiled. So you send a lot of women roses? Millions. I have a lot of fans. Dive instructors are almost like movie stars, you know? They are. You mean you didn't know and here I thought you were just another groupie. She laughed. Thanks a lot. Sure. Did anyone ask who they were from? She smiled. Of course. I hope you said good things. I did. I told them you were 68 and fat with a horrible lisp that made it impossible to understand you. But since you were so pitiful, I went ahead and had a lunch with you and now unfortunately you are stalking me. Hey, that hurts, he said. He paused, so I hope the roses will remind you that I'm thinking about you. They might, she said coyly. Well, I'm thinking about you and I don't want you to forget it. She glanced at the roses. Ditto. She said quietly. After they had hung up, Teresa sat quietly for a moment, reaching for the card again. She read it once more and this time, instead of putting it back with the flowers, she placed it in her purse for safekeeping. Knowing this crowd, she was sure someone would read it when she wasn't looking. So, what is he like? Diana sat across from Teresa at the table in the restaurant. Teresa handed Diana the picture from her vacation. I don't know where to start. Staring at the picture of Garrett and Teresa on the beach, Diana spoke without looking at her. Start at the beginning. I don't want to miss a thing. Since Teresa had already told her about meeting Garrett at the docks, she picked up her story from the evening that they spent sailing. She told Diana how she had 
purposely left her jacket on board as an excuse to see him again. To which Diana replied, marvelous, moving on to their lunch the next day and finally to their dinner. Recaping the final four days they spent together, she left very little out as Diana listened with a rapt attention. It sounds like you had a wonderful time. Diana said, smiling like a proud mother. I did. It was one of the best weeks I have ever spent. It's just that. What? It took a moment for her to answer, while Garrett said something towards the end that got me wondering where this whole thing was going to go from here. What did he say? It wasn't just what he said, but how he said it. He sounded as if he weren't sure he wanted us to see each other again. I thought you said that you were doing down to Wilmington again in a couple of weeks. I am. Then what's the problem? She fidgeted, trying to collect her thoughts. Well, he's still struggling with Catherine and, and I'm not exactly sure whether he'll ever get over it. Diana laughed suddenly. What's so funny? Tressa asked. Startled. You are Tressa. What did you expect? You know he was still struggling with Catherine before you went down there. Remember, it was his undying love that you found so attractive in the first place. Did you think that he completely get over Catherine in a couple of days? Just because you two hit it off so well. Tressa looked sheepish and Diana laughed again. You did, didn't you? That's exactly what you thought. Diana, you weren't there. You don't know how right everything seemed between us un until the last night. Diana's voice softened. Tressa, I know there is a part of you that believes you can change someone. But the reality is that you can't. You can change yourself and Garrett can change himself, but you can't do it for him. I know that. But you don't, Diana said, gently cutting her off. Or if you do, you don't want to see it that way. Your vision, as they say, has become clouded. Teresa thought for a moment about what she'd said. Let's take an objective look at what happened with Garrett, shall we? Diana asked. Teresa nodded. Though you know something about Garrett, he know absolutely nothing about you. Yet, he was the one who asked you to go sailing. So something between you two must have clicked right away. Next, you see him again when you picked up your jacket and he asks you to lunch. He tells you about Catherine and then asks you to come over for dinner. After that, you spend four wonderful days together getting to know and care for each other. Had you told me before you'd left that this is what would have happened, I wouldn't have believed it possible, but it did. That's the thing, and now you two are planning to see each other again. To me, it sounds like a whole thing was smashing success. Then you mean 
I shouldn't worry about whether he'll ever get over Catherine. Diana shook her head. Not exactly. But look, you have got to take this one step at a time. The fact is, you only spent a few days together so far. That's not enough time to make a decision about something like this. If I were you, I'd see how you both feel over the next couple of weeks, and when you see him the next time, you are bound to know a lot more than you know. Do you think so? Teresa eyed her friend worriedly. I was right about twisting your arm to get you down there in the first place, wasn't it? While Teresa and Diana were eating, Garrett was working in his office behind a giant stack of papers when the door opened. Jeb Blake entered, making sure that his son was alone before closing the door behind him. After taking a seat in the chair across from Garrett's desk, Jeb pulled some tobacco and rolling paper from his pocket and began to roll his cigarettes. Go ahead and sit down. As you can see, I don't have much to do. Garrett just read towards the pile. Jeb smiled and continued rolling. I called the shop a couple of times and they said you hadn't come in all week. What have you been up to? Leaning back in his chair, Garrett eyed his father. I'm sure you already know the answer to your question and that's probably the reason you are here. You were with Tressa the whole time. Yes, I was. Continuing to roll his cigarettes, Jeb asked non Chanlanti, so what did you two do with yourselves? We went sailing, walked on the beach, talked, you know, just go to know each other. Jeb finished with his cigarettes and put it in his mouth. He pulled a Zippo lighter from his front shirt pocket lit up and inhaled deeply. Exhaling, he gave Garrett a roguish grin. Did you cook those steaks like I thought you? Garrett smirked, of course. Was she impressed? She was very impressed. Jabe nodded and took another drag from his cigarette. Garrett could feel the air in the cough office beginning to grow stale. Well, then, she has at least one good quality, doesn't she? She's got a lot more than one dad. You liked her, didn't you? Very much. Even though you don't know her very well. I feel like I know everything about her. Jeb nodded and said nothing for a moment. Finally he asked, are you going to see her again? Actually, she's coming down in a couple of weeks with her son. Jeb watched Garrett's expression carefully, then standing. He started towards the door before opening it. He turned and faced his son. Garrett, can I give you some advice? Startled at his father's abrupt departure, he answered, sure. If you like her, if she makes you happy, and if you feel like you know her, then don't let her go. Why are you telling me this? 
Jeb looked directly at Garrett and took another drag on his cigarettes. Because if I know you, you are going to be the one who ends it and I'm here to try to stop you if you can. What are you talking about? You know exactly what I'm talking about, he said quietly. Turning around, Jeb opened the door and left Garrett's office without another word. Later that night, with the remnants of his father's comments rolling through his head, Garrett couldn't sleep. He rose from his bed and went to the kitchen, knowing what needed to be done. In the driver, he found the stationery he always used when his mind was conflicted. And he sat down with the hopes of putting his thoughts into words. My darling Catherine, I don't know what's happening to me. And I don't know if I ever will. So much has happened lately that I can't make sense of what I'm going through. Garrett sat at the table for an hour after writing those first two lines. And no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't think of anything else to say. But when he woke the following morning, unlike most days, his first thought wasn't about Catherine. Instead, it was about Teresa. Over the next two weeks, Garrett and Teresa spoke on the phone every night. Sometimes for hours. And Garrett also sent a couple of letters, short notes really, to let her know that he missed her and he had another dozen roses delivered the following weeks. This time with a box of candy. Teresa didn't want to send him flowers or candy, so instead she sent him a light blue Oxford shirt she thought would look good with his jeans. Along with a couple of cards, Kevin arrived home a few days later and it made the next week pass much more quickly for Teresa than for Garrett. His first night home, Kevin ate dinner with Teresa, telling her about his vacation in fits and starts before collapsing into a deep sleep for almost 15 hours. When he woke, there was already a long list of things that needed to be done. He needed new clothes for school. He'd already outgrown most of what he'd worn the previous year. And he had to sign up for fall league soccer, which ended up talking almost an entire Saturday. In addition, He'd come home with a suitcase full of dirty laundry that needed to be washed and he wanted to develop the pictures he'd taken on his vacation. And he had a Tuesday afternoon appointment with the orthodontist to see if he needed braces. In other words, life was back to normal at the Osborne household. On Kevin's second night back, Teresa told him about her vacation at the Cape, then about her trip to Wilmington. She mentioned Garrett trying to convey how she felt about him without alarming Kevin. At first, when she explained how they were going to visit him the following weekend, Kevin didn't sound so sure about it. But after she told him what Garrett did for a living, Kevin began to show some sign of interest. You mean he might teach me how to scuba dive? He asked as she was vacuuming the house. He said that he would if he wanted to. Cool, he said, returning to whatever he'd been doing before. 
A few nights later, she took him to the store to get him a few magazines about diving. By the time they were ready to leave, Kevin knew the same of every piece of equipment. It was possible to own obviously dreaming about his upcoming adventure. Garrett, meanwhile, plunged ahead with work. He worked late thinking about Teresa while he did so. Acting much the same way he had after Catherine dead, when he mentioned to his father how much he missed Teresa, his father only nodded and smiled. Something in his father's assessing gaze made Garrett wonder what exactly was going through the old man's mind. By prior agreement, both Teresa and Garrett had decided it would be best if she and Kevin didn't stay at Garrett's house. But because it was still summer, nearly every room in town was booked. Luckily, Garrett knew the owner of a small motel a mile up the beach from Garrett's house. And he had been able to make arrangements for their stay. When the day finally came for Teresa and Kevin to visit, Garrett bought some groceries, washed his truck inside and out, and showered before heading to the airport. Dressed in hockey pants, topsiders, and the shirt that Teresa had bought him, he waited nervously at the gate. In the last two weeks, his feeling for Teresa had grown. He now knew that whatever happened between him and Teresa wasn't based simply on physical attraction. His longing hinted at something much deeper, more lasting. As he craned his neck for a glimpse of her among the passengers, he felt a pang of anxiety. It had been so long since he'd felt this way about anyone, and where was it all going? When Teresa stepped off the plane with Kevin beside her, all his nervousness suddenly faded away. She was beautiful, more so than he remembered. And Kevin, he looked exactly like his picture and a lot like his mother. He was a little over five feet with Teresa's dark hair and eyes. And gangly, both his arms and his legs seems to have grown a little faster than the rest of him. He was wearing a long Bermuda shorts, Nike shoes, and a shirt from a concert by Hootie and the Bluefish. His choice of appeal was clearly inspired by MTV, and Garrett couldn't help but smile to himself. Boston, Wilmington, it really didn't matter, did it? Kids would be kids. When Teresa saw him, she waved, and Garrett moved towards him reached for their carry-on bags, not sure whether he should kiss her in front of Kevin, he hesitated until Teresa leaned over and gaily kissed him on the cheek. Garrett, I'd like you to meet my son Kevin, she said. Hi Kevin, hi Mr. Blake, he said stiffly, as if Garrett were his teacher. Call me Garrett, he said, holding out his hand, and Kevin shook it a little unsure. Until this point, no adult other than Annette had said that he could use their first name. How was your flight? Garrett asked. Good, Teresa responded. Did you get anything to eat? Not yet. Well, how about we grab a bite before I take you to 
your motel. Sounds good. Do you want anything in particular? Garrett asked Kevin. I like McDonald's. No, honey, no, Teresa said quickly, but Garrett stopped her with a shake of his head. McDonald's is fine with me. You sure? Teresa asked. Positive, I ate there all the time. Kevin looked delighted at his answer and the three of them started walking towards the baggage claim area as they left the gates. Garrett asked, are you a good swimmer, Kevin? Pretty good. Are you up for some scuba lessons this weekend? I think so. I have been reading up on it, he said, trying to sound older than he was. Well, good. I was hoping you'd say that. If we are lucky, we may even be able to get you certificate before you head back. What does that mean? It's a license that allows you to dive whenever you want, kind of like a driver's license. You can do that in a few days. Sure, you are required to take a write and test and spend a few hours in the water with an instructor. But since you'll be my only student this weekend, unless your mother wants to learn too, we should have more than enough time. Cool, Kevin said. He turned towards Teresa. Are you gonna learn too, mom? I don't know, maybe. I think you should, Kevin said. It would be fun. He's right, you should learn too. Garrett added with a smirk, knowing she would feel cornered by the two of them and probably give in. Fine, she said, rolling his eyes. I will go too, but if I see any sharks, I'm quitting. You mean there might be sharks? Kevin asked quickly. Yeah, we'll probably see some sharks, but they are a little... And they don't bother people. How little? Tressa asked, remembering the story he told about the hammerhead he'd encountered. Little enough that you won't have anything to worry about. Are you sure? Positive. Cool. Kevin repeated to himself and Tressa glanced at Garrett wondering if he was telling the truth. After picking up their bags and stopping for a bite to eat, Garrett drew Tressa and Kevin to the motel. Once their things were inside, Garrett went back to his track, returning with a book and some papers under his arms. Kevin, these are for you. What are they? It's the book and the test you need to read for your certification. Don't worry, it looks like there is more to read than there is. But if you want to hit out tomorrow, you have to have the first two sections read and complete the first test. Is it hard? No, it's pretty easy, but you still have to do it, and you can use the books to find the answer you are not sure about. You mean I can look up the answer while I take the test? Garrett nodded, yeah, when I give this to my classes, they are supposed to do them at home, and I'm sure almost everyone uses the book. The important thing is that you try to learn what you needed to know. Diving is a lot of fun, but it can be dangerous if you don't know what you are doing. Garrett handed Kevin's the book as he went on. 
If you can finish by tomorrow, it's about 20 pages to read plus the test will head to the pool for the first part of your certification. You will learn how to put on your equipment and then will practice for a while. We are not going in the ocean. Not tomorrow. You have to spend some time getting comfortable with the equipment first. After we spent a few hours doing that, then we'll be ready. We will probably hit the ocean on Monday and Tuesday for your first open water dives. And if you get enough horse in the waters, you leave a temporary certification by the time you step on the plane to go home. Then all you have to do is mail an application and you'll get the actual certification in a mail in a couple of weeks. Kevin began to flip through the page. Does mom have to do it too? If she wants to be certifi certified, she does. Teresa walked over, peeking over Kevin's shoulder as he glanced through the book. The information didn't look too daunting. Kevin, she said, we can do it together tomorrow morning if you are too tired to start now. I'm not too tired, he said quickly. Then would you mind if Garrett and I talk on the patio for a while? No, go ahead, he said absently, already turning to the first page. Once outside, Garrett and Teresa sat across from each other, glancing back at her son, and Teresa saw that Kevin was already reading. You are not cutting any corners to get him certified, are you? Garrett shook his head. No, not at all. To get a Pay ADY certificate, the certificate for recreational divers. You need to pass the test and spend a certain amount of time in the water with an instructor. That's all. Usually, we pace it out over three or four weekends, but that's because most people don't have time to do it during the week. He will get the same numbers of hours, it's just more. Condensed. said. I appreciate you doing this for him. Hey, you forget this is what I do for a living. After making sure that Kevin was still reading, he scooted his chair a little closer. I missed you this last couple of weeks, he said quietly, taking her hand in his. I missed you too. You look wonderful, he added. You are easily the prettiest woman who got off the plan. Despite herself, Teresa blushed. Thanks, you look good yourself, especially wearing that shirt. I thought that you might like it. Are you disappointed that we are not staying at your place? Not really. I understand your reasons. Kevin doesn't know me from Adam, and I'd rather let him get comfortable with me on his own terms than push it on him. Like you said, he's been through enough already. You know that it means we won't be able to spend much time alone this weekend, don't you? I will take you any way I can get you. He said. Teresa glanced inside again, and when she saw that Kevin was immersed in the book, she leaned over and kissed Garrett. Despite the fact that she wouldn't be with him all night, she found herself surprisingly happy. Sitting beside him and seeing the way he looked at her made her heart beat surge. 
I wish we didn't live so far apart, she said. You are kind of addicting. I'll take that as a compliment. Three hours later, long after Kevin was asleep, Teresa quietly led Garrett to the door. After stepping out into the hall and closing the door behind them, they kissed for a long time. Both of them finding it hard to let each other go. In his arms, Tressa felt like a teenager again, as if she were sneaking a kiss on her parents' porch. And it somehow added to the excitement she was feeling. I wish you could stay here tonight, she whispered. I do too. Is it as difficult for you to say good night as it is for me? I'd be willing to bet it's a lot more difficult for me. I'm going home to an empty house. Don't say that. You'll make me feel guilty. Maybe a little guilt is a good thing. Let me know you care. I wouldn't be down here if I didn't. They kissed again, hungrily. Pulling back, he mumbled. I should really be going. He didn't sound as if he meant it. I know. But I don't want to, he said with a boyish smile. I know what you mean, she said, but you have to, you have got to teach us how to dive tomorrow. I'd rather teach you a couple of other things I know. I think you did that the last time I was here, she said coyly. I know, but practice makes perfect. Then we'll have to find some time to practice while I'm here. You think that might happen? I think, she said honestly, that when it's come to us, anything is possible. I hope you are right. I'm right, she said before kissing him one last time. I usually am. She gently pulled away from him and back it towards the door. That's what I like about you, Teresa. Your confidence. You are always know what's going on. Go home, Garrett, she said demurely, and do me a favor. Anything. Dream about me, okay? Kevin woke early the next morning and opened the curtains, letting sunlight flood into the room, and Teresa squinted and rolled over, trying to get a few more minutes rest, but Kevin was persistent. Mom, you have got to take the test before we go, he said excitedly. Teresa ground, turning over, and she checked the clock. A little after 6 a.m., she'd been in bed less than five hours. It's too early, she said, closing her eyes again. Can you give me a five more minutes, honey? We don't have time, he said, sitting on her bed and nodding her shoulder gently. You haven't even read the first section yet. Did you finish it all last night? Yep, he said. My test is over there, but don't copy, okay? I don't want to get into trouble. I don't think you'd get in trouble, she said groggily. We know the teacher, you know. But it wouldn't be fair, and besides, you have to know this stuff, just like Mr. Blake, I mean Garrett, said, otherwise you could run into trouble. 
Okay, okay, she said, sitting up slowly, and she rubbed her eyes. Do they have any instant coffee in the bathroom? I didn't see any, but if you want, I run down the hall and get you a cook. I have some change in my purse. Kevin jumped up and began rummaging through her handbag. After finding a few quarters, he ran out of the front doors and his heart puzzled from sleeping. She heard his feet thumping as he raced down the hall and after standing and stretching her arms above her head. She made her way to the small table and she picked up the book and started it on the first chapter just as he returned with two cokes. Here you go, he said, putting one on the table beside her. I'm going to shower and get ready. Where do you put my swimsuit? Ah, oh, the endless energy of childhood, she thought. It's in the top drawer next to your socks. Okay, he said, pulling the drawers open. Got it. He went to the bathroom and Tressa listened as the shower was turned on. Opening the, her cook, she returned to the books. Luckily, Garrett had been right when he told her that the information wasn't difficult. It was easy reading with pictures describing the equipment and she was finished by the time Kevin was dressed. After finding her test, she sat it in front of her and Kevin walked over and stood behind her as she glanced at the first question. Remembering where she'd read about it, she began to flip back through the book to the appropriate page. Mom, that's an easy one. You don't need the book for that. At six in the morning, I need all the help I can get. She grumbled, not feeling the least but guilty about it. Garrett had said she could use the book, hadn't he? Kevin continued to look over her shoulder as she answered the first couple of questions and commenting, No, you are looking in the wrong place. Or, are you sure you read the chapters? Until she finally told him to go watch TV, but there is nothing on, he said, sounding dejected. Then read something. I didn't bring anything. Then sit quietly. I am. No, you are not. You are standing over my shoulder. I'm just trying to help. Just sit on the bed, okay, and don't say anything. I'm not saying anything. You are talking right now. That's because you are talking to me. Can't you let me take the test in peace? Okay, I won't say another word. I be as quiet as a mouse. And he was for two minutes. Then he started whistling. She put her pen down and faced him. Why are you whistling? I'm bored. Then turn on the TV. There is nothing on. And so it went until she finally finished. It had taken almost an hour to do something she could have done in her office in a half the time. She took a long hot shower and dressed, putting on her swimsuit beneath her clothes. Kevin 
No, Famshed wanted to go to the McDonald's again, but she drew the line and suggested that they have breakfast at the Waffle House across the street. But I don't like their food. You haven't ever eaten there before, I know. Then how do you know you don't like it? I just know. Are you omniscient? What does that mean? It means, young man, that we are going to eat where I want to eat for once. Really? Yes, she said, looking forward to a cup of coffee more than she had in a long time. Garrett knocked at the front door of their motel room promptly at nine and Kevin raced to the door to answer it. Are you two ready? he asked. We sure are. Kevin answered quickly, my test is over there, let me get it for you. He skipped over to the table as Teresa rose from the bed and gave Garrett a quick kiss good morning. How was your morning? he asked. It already seems like afternoon and Kevin got me up at the crack of dawn to take the test. Garrett smiled as Kevin returned with his test. Here it is, Mr. Blake, Garrett, I mean. Garrett took it and began to look through his answer. My mom had some trouble with a couple, but I helped her out. Kevin went on and Teresa rolled her eyes. Ready to go, mom? Whenever you are, she said, picking up the room key and her purse. Then come on, Kevin said, leading the way down the hall towards Garrett's track. Throughout the morning and early afternoon, Garrett taught them the basic of scuba diving. They learned how the equipment worked how to put it on and test it, and finally how to breathe through the mouthpiece. First on the side of the pool, then underwater. The most important thing to remember, Garrett explained, is to breathe normally, don't hold your breath. Don't breathe too quickly or slowly, just let it come naturally. Of course, nothing seemed natural about it to Tressa, and she ended up having more trouble with it than Kevin. Kevin, always the adventurer, thought that after a few minutes underwater, he knew all there was to know. This is easy, he said to Garrett. I think I'll be ready for the ocean this afternoon. I'm sure you would, but we still have to do the lesson in a proper order. How is mom doing? Good, as good as me. You are both going great, he said, and Kevin put the mouthpiece back in, and he went back underwater just as Teresa came up and took out her mouthpiece. It feels funny when I breathe, she said. You are doing fine. Just relax and breathe normally. That's what you said the last time I came up gagging. The rules haven't changed in the last few minutes, Tressa. I know that. I just wonder if something isn't wrong with my tank. The tank is fine. I double-checked it in this morning, but you are not the one using it, aren't you? Would you like me to test it out? No, she muttered, squinting in frustration. I will manage. Underwater, she went again. 
Kevin opened up and took his mouthpiece out. Is mom okay? I saw her come up. She's fine, just getting used to it like you are. Good. I feel really bad if I got my certification and she didn't. Don't you worry about her. Just keep practicing. Okay. And so it went. This video is taken for Navi Daria's page.